So now we're we're cooking with gas, as they say in Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, Eddie. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to meet me and share your life and work as an artist and Trinidad and Tobago citizen. God, I'm ever so proud of that. So tell me, you know, I wanted this conversation to be about you, about what you're currently working on. You said um, in our brief conversation before that you're tired going over the old stories about what happened. But do you want to tell us about your creative process a little bit, about your drawing, your painting, your how do you work? And then we'll get to the new projects. Um, some years ago, I was, uh, as you know, involved with... Um, a couple of a couple of chaps in in art down here, Steve Udit, um, Cozier, you know, um, and a few others. Sorry, can I ask? You to, can I ask you to start again? I'm sorry, I forgot to put another recording on. Okay, okay. I'll just ask the question again. Right. So, hi, Eddie. Good morning. Yes, Thanks for morning. taking the time to come and meet us today. Can you tell us a little bit about your process? of creation out there in Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah, um, it's it's uh, nearly 40 years now. Um, so I'll go, go back briefly to the first 10 years. I, I met up with um, a group, a, a set of other artists, my kind of age, now come back from, you know, the developed world. Um, they were and and I very cerebral working with um reading a lot of text about you know psychology and this and that and you know that kind of stuff that you read when you're in your kind of like mid twenties and you want to know about you know how your brain works and how the world is you know so you go into Jung and all those kinds of people and others um Anyway, I had kind of like 10 years of that. Then I realized that, that that kind of like devouring of text wasn't really me. Um, and I decided that if there was a text, that it was embedded in my work. And that um, my, my specific abilities allowed me to work very quickly. And across the board, in a certain way, I had no no desire for any kind of stylistic or even geographical relevance. I just live here and my family's been here for a long time. And I didn't feel the need that I had to prove anything to do with being Caribbean or any of those stories. In those days, that was just a nascent idea, but that has come to me more powerfully over the years that I just happened to be here. And, um, it's pretty good. I'd rather be here than in cold England where I spent a lot of my childhood. Right. Um, I'd rather be here for many, many reasons. Um, too long to list. Um, there's no real, there's no national pride or anything like that to do with me being here. It just, it just so happens that I have, um, ancestral blood blood links and a, as good a place to sort of put my feet down as anywhere else absolutely as a matter of fact some other artists who are from those colder places have voluntarily uh set up shop in trinidad if we won't name well them. you know Nicola, at any one point there's probably a hundred thousand people out there who want to be where i am in the sunshine you know i mean and that is not that's not a flippant statement there's you know there's if there's a hundred thousand, you know, there are a hundred thousand people out there who kind of like could log into this, they might want a nice sunny morning outside with the doors open and the dog next to me on the ground and fucking cat somewhere, you know, and it's kind of <laughs> peace, it's kind of peaceful, you yeah. know? Yeah. There's no cold wind blowing outside and there's no fucking Donald Trump. That's that's that I'm I'm jumping in there. <laughs> yeah. So so I I I about about 20 years ago, I a little longer than that, I, I, I decided to transfer my questioning to sort of like the issues of daily life and in the studio where, um, where my chaos and the confusions of, of just life could just get worked out through the text and the work. 
Um, and I would meditate in that and just do the fucking work, you know, and see what came out. Right. Rather than have an idea about what I wanted to work about, I I don't have any idea. I I think life itself is a big idea. And when I come in here, it, another set of processes is happening because I got to pick up the paint and the paint is not a set of words. It's not it's not words that you string together. It's it's weights and measures, abstract weights and measures that have other resonances. So um, I, I I still read stuff and I'm still kind of very interested in all the philosophy and everything. You can't help but be that. But in the studio, it's not about that. So that two gets things. get kind of condensed in the studio. It's kind of like it's there. I can't possibly deal with the magnitude of daily shit and daily re relevances. It's just way too much. It's just too much. You know, race, class, history, tear down the 1%, war, pestilence, everything. It's been going on for thousands of fucking years. It doesn't appear to have stopped. Probably so never I, will. Yeah, so I, I try and keep, you know, there's there's a war in here. Um, and I better deal with that one. So tell us about the works behind you, because those seem to be good examples. I love that we have matching works behind us. Yours kind of has the same coloration, not the exact same, but similar to the one behind me. This is um a, a piece of work called The Edge of the White Forest, and it's the cover of this book. Right. We'll get to that next. Yeah. So tell um, us about those two works. Well, that one, and there's another one there, which is called um, Red Hill. Um, these these are extended exercises in, in painting, which is, there's a kind of, I, I invented an essay about 35 years ago called The Road Through Abstraction, which is basically that I come to paint, and my first gestures are, about putting down some colors and I'm not really sure what colors, whatever happens to be there. And then I make it up as I go along from that point because I got nothing else to do. <laughs> you know, I don't, like I said, I don't have a theme. I don't have a theme. I put the color down and then my imagination takes over from, from the, the, the sequences that happen next, which is still about balancing out what happens on the canvas. Um, and stories kind of will inevitably emerge. I will want to tell myself something. There's a there's a there's a kind of a play between how the ego is working and how the ego gets squashed to let the paint happen. And so there's this kind of like switching between some desire to create order because it's kind of abstract right through. I could all be an abstract painter, really, but um I, I live in this world and I absorb things from this world, which are um, visceral every day. It creeps in and it creeps out of the process. And I eventually end up telling some kind of story. But I'm not sure what what that story is. Right. Um, it, every painting comes out slightly different, of course. And, and that's the other thing that I like to happen, because every painting does come out with some kind of um, next next thematic or next strand in a very long story or strands of things, if you see what I mean. Yes. Um, and I, I like that. I like that. So tell us about the drawing then, the work on paper. I mean, I think it's a work on paper to your left. Oh, that is um, the architect of impossible physics since 1987. It's it's a, a, a how many years is that? It's a thirty something year odyssey. Wow! It's it's, it's um, four of these will be on show at the launch. Um, oh, yes. So tell us about that Eddie Bowen, uh, the book you made with some writers, Black Light Void, Dark Visions of the Caribbean, edited by Marsha Pierce, because that's what you're talking about, right? At the launch. Yeah, on, on Saturday. Um, Marsha Pierce was an ex-student of mine at UWE nearly 20 years ago. And she became quite um, a notable scholar, an art scholar down here. Um, and 
her, her work has gone um, abroad. She's extremely kind of like solid is a good word, um, thorough in her research. Anyway, I had a show um, of some big painting, including this one behind me, about four or five years ago, a show called Stories, Y Gallery. She came along and she proposed an idea of some writers responding to or getting off on specific paintings and developing their own texts and stories as a result. And I, I said to her, well, why not? <laughs> Go right ahead. And I think she's done, um, I think she's made the equivalent of what is an art statement. The book is quite a nice, nice, it's a, took four years. It's, it's a considerable document. Um, nicely presented. It feels good in your hand. Well, what I love about that, just from my own experience out here in the West, in the cold, is that you guys are working on similar stuff to some of the biggest galleries in the world. So you're right. Even though you're somewhat outside in the warm Caribbean, relatively big island, but you guys have somehow worked on similar projects to let's say a Gagosian. Because I well, know let me tell you let me let me tell you something, Nicolette. I I you mentioned how we're kind of like appear to be somewhat on the on the side, maybe peripheral to you know the the larger kind of like metropolitan sets of discussions. Mm -hmm. Um I don't think there's a periphery anymore. I I I I'm just on the end of a digital connection now. Um, I think um, I was completely unaware of what you what you just mentioned, um, but I, I long think that we down here, um, because we've been perceived as being on the periphery, have had a certain kind of intellectual freedom for quite some time that is very rarely exploited. I think it was first exploited by the writers, um, you know, and hence, you know, I mean, we have the the Walcott and, and Naipaul and, and others, you know, they're, they're kind of like the two kingpins, but there are others of notable skills, you know, and then in the last 20, 30 years, the, the women have just been putting down texts like crazy. Right. Um, and that, that also is extremely significant um, and completely contemporary, as I understand. And they've been dealing with a whole world of stuff that was just there all the time and it's just coming out. And um there's there's no license for it, as they say down here, you know. And that's you know, I, I live in I live in this kind of place where I mean for the sake of a Zoom meeting, we're we're in the we're in the center. Um we're or we have access to the center. So I think it's it's like anywhere else these days, it's a kind of a timing. You know, um, who's got time to sort of cue in on your little story over here? Um, well, this is a very good question, and I won't go into this right now, but I'm reminding myself that I'm going to follow up with you because I've had an idea for years, and there's another artist who has been pushing me to get this going. I think perhaps you could help me rally a team of artists to figure out who we can speak to in the government to put Trinidad and Tobago in the Venice Biennale. I've been asking this for years. It's almost like, I don't even want to get into it on this. Like I said, that's too long a discussion, but I'm going to follow up with you after this call to see what we can do to put a bunch of, I have, have some contacts to figure that out. I have very briefly um, been in contact with the lady in Grenada, Susan Mains. Mm -hmm. And Grenada has been to the last three Venice Biennales. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if if Grenada is this big, we are like the size of the room in terms of output and kind of like equal or not equal in terms of, you know, quantum of mm -hmm. art being made. Right. Um, there, there is, um, you know, I don't want to say publicly and on this forum, but you know, right. there, are, there are one or two mitigating circumstances here that have prevented things from happening. That's why I said we'll talk about it after. But yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. But let's get back to your work now. And do you want to talk about the plantation project? We have about another fifteen minutes. So, um, it's I, I, um, 
by virtue of of being extended and born in a long kind of like colonial and empire situation family uh, like many other thousands of west indians and people on the equatorial belt um found myself as an inheritor to lands um and i decided to take it on about 30 years ago and i ended up buying more land because i had a couple of shrewd moves that gave me some cash so i bought more fucking land and it's old plantation land and um some years ago when i was um about well when i was with a particular lady we were managing one of the estates up in the north and there were inherent historical racial problems that come with that kind of position and um subsequently um my life was threatened more than once up there um la 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 i left and came back on two more occasions um, but who's over the threatening last... your, who's threatening your life local people because they don't want you there on the land it's a bit more complicated than that but yes um yeah and you know i don't want to be racist but it's local people right and um i am one of those people also by blood just my skin tone is a little lighter in certain ways but i'm of that i'm of the the creole generation anyway la 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 history race class culture all that shit um but i ended up in charge of nearly 400 acres altogether. And one of them has a population of village on it. And I manage that. I come like the fucking mayor. <laughs> I sign papers. I sign papers. I organize letters for people to get water, electricity connections, to have specific letters for whatever um, land agency, government records are needed um i grew up in that it's kind of second nature it's difficult work um occasionally dangerous it doesn't really pay me but i have my a house and a studio in the middle of the village up in san Susi, and i guard it ferociously and um i am one of the cussed villages as well Okay. Because I live, I live there. I supplement the income in my little way. I help out in my little way. Mm -hmm. And over the last twenty or thirty years, you know, I've heard about, you know, the activists who talk about reparations and who talk about all this kind of thing between the races and all this kind of stuff. And I find myself in a living contradiction, um, with young men um, dispossessed up in the countryside occasionally violent um all those kinds of problems that go with that kind of environment incest rape theft destruction of the environment all that every last fucking little apostrophe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i i i have been working that for 30 years and so i listen to all these kind of new activists who are talking about what they're going to do to help the environment and help you know, poor black people and this and that, you know, and I just say, well, come and spend six fucking months with me. And then you will have a real chance, you know, to sort of like let the sun beat you on your back and let you get cussed because you speak a different way and but you think you want to help, but you have no fucking idea what you're talking about. The reality of the situation. The absolute on the ground reality of the situation. I was burgled last year. Um, typical circumstances. It was a setup. But it's not the first time, you see. But I'm going back because that's my house. But there was, there was, you know, I mean, they burgle each other. They see from each other. It's, it's not just where I am. It's, it's a, it's an it's an inherited bad hangover 
of colonialism that gets labeled as something else and how we're supposed to in this generation feel guilty and sorry for ourselves but all that's bullshit as well right in, in my, my humble working opinion um because over the years, at some point, I was the most hated man up there. And now some of those former enemies now come up my step and we sit down and we have coffee and smoke a little joint and they tell me how life was tough. So they hated me because life was tough. And I said, well, I understand because I hated you too. <laughs> I hated you more than you hated fucking me. Right. And, and, and so, you know, I mean, uh, but I'm... I'm in the middle of it, you know, and I'm just admitting what come what has come through my my head. You know, I'm being really straight up, you know. I mean, a lot of people would kind of like want to put, you know, rose tinted glasses over this thing, you know, and pretend that they're not sometimes a little bit racist. Right. You know, and sometimes really turned into a hater. Yeah. I was in jail a few years ago, you know, I spent an afternoon in jail because of this shit. You know, and so I went, you know, just kind of thought, well, okay, well, that that's a, that was a development in the fucking story, you know what I mean? Um, but you know, hindsight now it's just part part of part of the part of the road. I'm still here. So you're able to work in that environment to be creative? Yeah, they don't bother me because they know I'm an artist and they love that. <laughs> Everybody loves art. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves fucking art, you know. I mean, they might not understand it, but you know. I tell them, don't bother me because I'm making some paintings and fuck off. <laughs> you don't do this, I do this. You know, I have my place and I do this here, you know, and I happen to like it here. And, and over the years, that, that message of my own particular present identity has come out that I'm equally as bad-tempered as everybody else. And I've got this work to do, you know? So um, I don't get bothered really, you know? Um, well, what's interesting is that uh, balance between the administrative work you talked about and this creative process in the studio making art. I mean, not many artists uh, go between both worlds, I think, unless they have a job, let's say. Well, if you're a teacher in the university, you've got to fill out all kinds of forms about That's true. inputs and outputs and kind of like play the role to the rules of the institution. And, you know, they, they kind of like, you know, give you money for your time. Yeah, I just happened to be born with a ready-made business that was a little awkward, right? Um, and you know, so I look at it that way. It's not, you know, I don't. It's the old plantation, and I'm just there to mop up an old story. And, so what um, what are you going to be doing with these plantations? Are you growing things? Are you? Yeah, like... I started one one out um outside of my door uh, up in San Susi. I had planted some mahogany twenty years ago, and. When I reached up there for the last, well, for the last two or three years, the trees have been podding. They've been making the seeds. And so on the ground outside of my door, it's like a thousand seeds. And I thought, oh, well, we can't just let the wind blow these away. So I went and bought some agricultural bags and I got a big compost heap outside. And every week I'll sit down with a little trowel and I'll put the seeds in the bag because the intention is to take them back into the plantation and plant these trees. You know, they, I call them oxygen machines. <laughs> and mahogany is very aggressive, you know, and once you've got them established in a bag, you just have to put the whole bag in a hole, take it away, and basically go and check on it every three months. Right. And 20 years, you've got some fairly big trees. It brings back the birds, the creatures, Excellent for soil retention, carbon sinking, the whole fucking thing. Right. So um, the colonials weren't all bad, you know. They planted a whole lot of trees. They clicked down a whole lot of trees, but they also put back quite a lot. Yes. Um, which, is, which is part of the story that nobody really knows. Um, my forebears planted a lot of trees. So I don't know, I'm doing something that's in, in the old footprint, really. And it's yeah. not too bad. It provides a little job. You know, it's very green, you know. And one that day when they start to give us credits for carbon carbon things. Right, right, right. I, right. I got a whole lot of money to cash it on. 
<laughs> well, you know, that's what uh, I learned recently. I don't know why I never thought of it, but trees are so counted as a renewable resource because they always grow again. Yeah. It's, yeah. Which is interesting. I never really thought of it. But I, I mean, there are tons of companies now who part of their philosophy is to like plant a tree. There's one clothing brand from Brazil, you know, whenever you buy an item from them, they plant a tree. So I like your initiative on an individual basis. And I think it's a good contribution to the world in general, who's starting to realize we need to breathe still. <laughs> well, there's another, there's another reason for it, which is up, up in the village in Sands, you see, mm -hmm. a lot of these villages have cut down a considerable amount of lumber thieved and cut down a whole lot. I just want to put back and create another a balance because it's it's you know it's it's um it's a certain level of ignorance and opportunism. Um one of the inherent problems of those kinds of environments. Um you know I'm not into blaming I'm, you know I'm just saying well shut up and plant some trees. So that's what I'm doing, you know? You can come I can complain from now until doesn't really do anything. Plant some fucking trees. Right. So you have the book launch this weekend, and that's going mm. to be a, a fun event, I'm sure. And then what are you doing after that? What are your uh, next plans, your future plans? Um, I have to go back to San to see. I've been out of there for over a year. I took a year from the administration. Uh, I had a show about exactly a year and two months ago in, in Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. I got burgled. I decided to fuck them and all that shit and all the work I was doing and I'd just take a break. Um, I went to England to check out the art scene there, uh, realized a few things, um, came back, got extremely depressed for about a few months. I did some work and now I, I started off the new year. I'm going back up the road, up on the country to, I've got the house there, better used it than not. And it's great studio space, and I got a bed, and I got a cooker, and it's got Wi-Fi, and it's kind of cool. Well, why know. did you? Th why do you think you got depressed from your travels, or from the burglary, or from life? Um, all of that, you know, middle-aged shit, you know. Yeah, it's kind of like you know, working for forty years. I uh, didn't sell one painting last year. That's kind of real fucked up, you know. I mean, because I I rely on. You know, not a regular sales, but, you know, you would have thought after 40 years in this place that you sell a painting every so often, a little drawing. Right. Nothing. Nothing. You know, I could tell you the same that's happening here. I mean, on a global level, they say the art market is soft. So just so you know, don't feel too bad. It's not just you. No, but you see, by contrast, a lot of my contemporaries at the same time were doing marginally well, you know, uh, one okay. or two on the international market, um, in marketplace. And, and an ex-student, um, an ex-student of mine, who I'm very proud of, um, got snapped up by a gallery in Germany um, two years after graduating from Dusseldorf. He's become a good friend. He was a student 10 years ago. Huh. Who's privately. that? Fellow called Justin Devertai. Oh, yeah, I know the name, but I don't know the work. I'll have to look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got kind of snapped up, you know, the kind of gallery kind of I like started loving his work. And, you know, and that's that's just like really great, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that again after. There are a couple of things I want to follow up with you individually. So we'll add that to the list. And um, okay. so good luck this weekend. I mean, we're almost at the 30 minute mark. Thank you for being here. Thank yeah. you. And, you know, sometimes things are cyclical. I know we get into a little um, expectation after 40 years, but, you know, work goes up, creativity goes up, sales go up, uh, our emotions go up. So just flow with it, you know, just. Well, uh, I'm, I'm an old, I, I mean, 35 years of yoga. I had to switch my mind. Um, I have a good house. The pets are OK. My children are OK. Um, the car's working. It's and a good start. Food, there's food. There's food in the pantry, you know. So I mean, thank God for today. Thank God for today. Okay, today. so I'm gonna stop the recording now. We'll catch I'm up in a bit. We will. Okay.